The morning's weather had shifted, the breeze now sharper, the clouds low and heavy as though clogged with pearls. The overhead leaves rippled, alternate black, brown and gold, and then the wind heaved stronger and colder, enough force it seemed to crumb the cement. My face burned with shame. Down the street, early Halloween candles glowed from the store windows, alone or in rows, fluttering within the cru crudely carved jack-o'-lantern eyes and wreck-toothed grins. How badly I wanted to get high again. I kept my shameful head to the ground and opened the passenger side door. When I got in beside her, she glanced at me as though our last hour had been harmless. Cinnamon bubblegum, she said. Precious memories. I put the key in the ignition but didn't start the truck. Waiting, I watched her. As the seconds passed, she only stared, peacefully amused, at the row of dashboard photographs. Finally, I raised my voice. When I said you should do all the talking, I certainly didn't mean that. Why would you say those things? Is this what you remembered, what you were supposedly saving for me? Oh, shh. If you want, we can talk more when we get home. Of course we're going to talk more. You're going to tell me everything. You said you remembered what happened back then, and I want to know now before you go into telling anyone else. Nothing like that will happen again until I know everything. She slipped a hand into her sweatshirt, reaching into its cottony underbelly. Take a look at this, she said. I'm so bad. I'm nothing but a thief. She dropped something on the seat beside the tape recorder, notepads, and pens. I raised it and saw that my mother had stolen a picture of Lacey. It was one of the little girl images, the smocked, rust-red dress, the buckled shoes, the shyly joyous curve to her mouth. My mother's grin and gleaming eyes made me uneasy. It felt like the panic that had gripped both Alice and me years ago as we'd sat listening to her warnings to the tale of her own disappearance. I still wanted my mother to confess her memories, but this moment didn't seem right, not here in the truck. You're horrible, I finally said. I know. I started the pickup and shifted into reverse. Before I backed from the parking space, I braved one final look through the cafe's curtains. I could see the waitress in her paper tiara and yoke yellow apron shuffling toward Mr. Weiler's table. I saw her drop something beside his plate, and then I realized our mistake. We forgot to pay the check, I said. I kept the truck idling and dashed back toward the cafe door, silently rehearsing my apology. A few bills remained in my wallet. I would unfold them on the table and leave. <clears throat> to the window, Mr. Weiler still sat at the padded booth, hunched over his coffee and untouched coconut cream, his scrapbook of pictures. And then I stopped. Even through the tarnished glass, through the scrim of curtain, I saw every detail. The man now stranded and wearied, grandfather to the lost girl, old man so lost himself, at this table in this strange town. He was alone, and he was weeping. Our interview had ended. We had left him with a check, but still no Lacey. I couldn't yet see his tears, but I saw the twitch to his lower lip, his shuddering sol shol shoulders, the lewd thread of drool on his chin. A noble man would have stepped inside to ask him more, would have paid the pale green check and somehow soothed his spokes of pain. But I was weak, not noble, and the weakness restricted me. I stood immobile at the door, unable to re-enter the cafe, that space gone sour with his grief. I could feel my heart straining toward it, but my bones were too faint to follow. Thanks. You have a special attraction to kidnapping. Do I have a special attraction to kidnapping? Well, of course. Um, <laughs> um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, like the mother in the book, my mom actually worked at a prison, and um, she, uh, there was this, the, the, the inmates of this prison would, you know, get books or magazines, but there were some that were, like, forbidden to them, so those were the ones that she could take on her own if she wanted to, and there was this magazine called True Detective, I don't know if they still publish it or not, but, um, uh, yeah, I would always have these stories of, like, kidnappings and murders, and there were always, always these really lurid, like, photographs on the cover, and um, she would always bring those home, and, you know, I was, I, pro I was probably, like, eight years old at the time or something, and um, I don't know, I was just really interested in reading those instead of the books at school, and, um, and it was something that sort of linked uh, my mother and me, because it was something we were both interested in, so, um, and that's crept up in, in my books years later. <laughs> yes, Josh. How much of an influence has your mom had, how much influence has she had in the book? Um, a lot. Uh, 
my big regret is that she died before I could finish it because you know I, I started writing it a long time ago when she was still alive, and I just uh, you know there's so many years that I had writer's block and I couldn't really finish it. But um, yeah, I mean the 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 character the the lead characters are are based really closely on on myself and on her, but um, you know there's also just a lot of completely fictional crap in it also that didn't really happen. I think. Um, when I went back to Kansas to take care of her, I thought that she still had like four or five months left to live, and um, she had always sort of told me these kind of uh, vague stories about her childhood and you know how she had this horrible childhood and really sort of um, abusive parents. And I, I think when I went home to take care of her, I, I had this idea that I was going to learn a lot more about her and about her childhood, and um, and it would be sort of like our time together. But then, she, you know, I got back to Kansas and she really didn't have much time left at all. It was just really a few weeks before, um, you know, until she died. And during those few weeks, she, you know, a lot of the time she wasn't really very coherent anyway. So I think in a way writing the book for me was kind of like my replacement for the time that, that I didn't get to share with her because I had so many questions about her past. So in writing the book, uh, I just, I wound up just creating, a, a, you know, like this secret past of hers or something. And when I started doing that, then the book really took off for me and I didn't really feel blocked anymore.